buonasera. Make yourself a delicious cup of hot chocolate or tea or pour a glass of wine and let's have a little chat. Thank you so much. You guys sent me over 600 questions when I asked here on YouTube and on my Instagram if you'd like a Q&A. I started filming this before I gave birth. I'm quite excited about the, the fact that any moment now I could I could literally go into, into labor during this video. So... Uh, but then I decided to re-record some of my answers and put in more cinematic visuals so that you don't just have to look at a boring shot of my face talking and waffling on for half an hour. Uh, let's start with this one asking about where I've lived. Okay, so I grew up in Australia, but I haven't lived there for many years. After high school at 17, I got a scholarship to study Japanese as an exchange student in Kobe. This was such an experience, it really taught me so much because it was back in the days before cell phones, there wasn't even Wi-Fi in the houses I lived in. I would write my family letters or go to a payphone occasionally if I wanted to communicate with them. After Japan, I returned to Australia and began a degree in journalism and communication in Queensland. I was disappointed with university life because I had looked forward to intellectually challenging debates and a community of people excited to learn. My teachers in high school always told me, just wait until you get to university, Kylie. You'll find like-minded people and work that really pushes you beyond your limits. And uh, since then, I've, I've heard friends speak of this type of experience in the US and Europe, but I think I went to the wrong university because no one seemed excited about ideas. The work didn't challenge me at all. In fact, I just submitted old essays that I'd written back in high school and still got good marks. So I was just craving a challenge. After a couple of years working and saving money while studying at university, I deferred my degree and went to live very briefly in Paris, then Barcelona, where I studied Spanish, and finally in Florence. In Europe, I instantly felt at home. I didn't make lifelong friends on that particular trip because I was still learning Spanish and Italian, and my regret didn't even get to start properly with French. But you know when you go to a couple of dinner parties or have a series of conversations with people in your travels and you just know you're in a place where you can be yourself or evolve and feel slightly out of your depth but motivated by how much uh, you have yet to learn culturally, linguistically, in terms of style, etiquette, politics, culinary knowledge, everything. I really thrive when I'm living in an environment that challenges me. Someone asked how I keep myself motivated or inspired. I love feeling that I'm somewhere where I have more to learn. I realize for some people, this uh, means a state of anxiety or alienation or never feeling like you belong. But for me, it works somehow. In my beautiful home country of Australia, life is very good and the people are wonderful. However, I, I really never felt like I was at home. Many people ask what I miss about Australia and how often I go back. I used to go back for Christmas uh, most years, but for the past few years, my parents have been coming to Italy instead. One thing I miss is that Australia is a very young society and consequently there's a very entrepreneurial spirit and a sincere appreciation for self-improvement. Of course, in some countries, this can be taken to the extreme and become obsessive, as exemplified by the heavily marketed self-help industry in countries where people have forgotten how to just live without some pseudo-spiritual guru. But for the most part, in Australia, back when I was living there 15 years ago, there was a fairly healthy kind of ambition. People work hard, but they go outside and run on their lunch breaks or finish work late, but then go out and enjoy fantastic restaurants or cook with fresh ingredients from the market, invest time in their relationships, but also really concentrate on, on career progression. I found in Italy, there isn't as much of a desire to improve uh, in all facets of life, one's health with exercise or conscious diet, improve one's relationship or emotional intelligence with therapy or literature or even reflection, improve one's social connections by organizing niche groups that meet up, or work hard to launch a startup or bring innovation to their company for the sheer creative satisfaction. This last one is not Italian's fault as there is 
such nepotism, corruption and citizens are taxed so heavily that there's very little incentive to work harder to be successful or run one's own business. Anyway, back to my timeline. So after this time in Europe, I went back to Australia to finish my degree in Melbourne at another university, after which I got jobs as a magazine editor and feature writer and then as a managing editor and senior publisher. This was one of my dreams, to be able to write long feature articles on business and topics that fascinated me, interviewing CEOs around the world, rather than writing about makeup or, um, I don't know, something a little bit more lightweight. I learned so much in those five years, and then my boss offered me the role of running the whole publishing house and managing 12 or 15 magazines, but I felt that there were no more mentors or room to grow and I could see that print was dying and editorial would inevitably be compromised by advertorial demands. Plus, I was still dreaming of Italy, just dreaming of getting back there and making a real life in that country. So I started working on a plan to pitch production companies around the world with a concept for a food and travel TV series set in Italy. I was taking the Italian verb dictionary to bed with me every night and studying one verb a night. I would come home from the office around 11 p.m., cook dinner for myself and my partner who owned restaurants, and we'd have dinner at around midnight, and then I would work on my pitch and my Italian until the wee hours of the morning. On weekends, I would uh, waitress and cook for functions in my boyfriend's restaurants to save extra money. Finally, I quit my job and moved to Italy and had to wait a year for different obstacles, but eventually broke into the world of TV and got my first show made as host and producer. Someone asked where I learned filmmaking. I am completely self-taught. At that point in Italy, money was tight and I couldn't afford film school. I did so many different jobs. I worked for an atelier in Rome that made couture gowns and actually dressed Audrey Hepburn when she lived in Rome. I flew to the US to translate for them, selling gowns to private clients in Saks and Neiman Marcus. I also started a small magazine in Rome with some Italians and I was freelance translating, which was laborious work because my Italian wasn't very good at that point, and doing some freelance writing jobs. But eventually, when I was being taken advantage of financially by production companies making these TV shows and and seeing that the cameraman didn't have the attention to to detail that, that I had hoped for, I decided to teach myself through trial and error, just watching YouTube tutorials, reading geeky tech forums, going to events where I could hear editors and cameramen speak of their craft. It's just so incredible how much we can access for free online. You can teach yourself an entire skill set alone in your bedroom. I organized sponsored trips to Amsterdam and London and San Francisco to go to cinematography conferences and events where I would speak about my experience making TV shows as a one girl, self-taught production house. And in between commitments, I would just soak up everything, speaking to experts to better understand cameras, lighting, audio, editing. At this point, I had fallen in love with an Englishman who was also my co-star on one of my TV shows, and I moved to London to live with him. But Honestly, we spent most of that time in Italy filming uh, because I was uh, just producing different TV shows at that point. I lived briefly on the Amalfi Coast in Positano, and then I fell in love with an Italian born in Monaco and moved to Monte Carlo, which actually still felt like Italy because it's full of Italians. Someone asked where I would live if not Italy. Well, I've spent a lot of time in the south of France, not just when I was living in Monaco, but also Uh, My parents were living for six months of every year in different parts of France, and I came to know and love it quite well. I then moved back to Rome and remained there for some years until I literally ran out of savings and had to give up my apartment. But at that point, I was dating an Italian physicist who had to be in Germany for his work, and I ended up living very briefly in the vineyards of Germany, which surprisingly felt a lot like Italy. I then moved to Florence, which was like coming home as it was the first Italian city I lived in all those years ago when I was 20, 21. I met my husband just before COVID and we moved in together almost immediately after we met. Someone asked how long we dated. I think it was just over a year before we got engaged. Uh, But we had been living together every single day since we first kissed. So things moved quite quickly. 
What kind of music do you love and does it inspire you? I think most of you know by now that I love classical music and jazz. It's what I grew up listening to. I played the flute when I was young and I always sang in the choir. My parents always had classical radio on in the house. We would go on picnics and bring a little uh, radio with a cassette tape playing Jane Russia, who was this Australian flautist, uh, or Mozart, or just, you know, all the classics. I value music so highly. A soundtrack can elevate cinematography to unimaginable heights. In fact, I always spend hours trawling through royalty-free music sites to purchase the perfect track for a, a color palette or a mood or the flavors of a recipe I'm filming for you. A music genre I never use in my videos is hip hop and R&B, but I absolutely adore this style of music and it is all I listen to when I run. Do play music and talk to your baby. Yes, absolutely. I actually sing to Fagiolino, to the little baby. Uh, while I go on these walks, I go on these long one or two hour walks and I, I sing to him uh, mostly because I just, I like singing, especially when I'm doing a solo walk. It's lovely. And my, in my family, we always would sing. My sister and I would always sing two part harmonies on long car trips. And uh, aside from that, they also say that if your baby can hear uh, certain songs, uh, then when you're singing them a lullaby, when they're out of the womb, gives them that, that nostalgia and calms them, supposedly, who knows, I don't know, because they, they recognize the song. Oh, films I love. It is so hard to make a short list of films, but let's just say the film I've seen the most uh, in my life would have to be The Sound of Music. It is such a classic. Aside from the magnificent music, uh, you just have this this epic story. I mean, this, this existential spiritual crisis, a love story, there's comedy, there's drama, there's action, there's escaping from Nazi soldiers. It's just got everything. And I love, I love how you, every time you think the story is finishing, it's just not. It goes on and on. And and uh, and it's just got such a, an incredible cast. I mean, Julie Andrews and Christopher Plummer, who I had a huge crush on my whole life. Uh, it's, yeah, honestly, just, just such a, a beautiful film. Uh, Stealing Beauty is a classic I've always talked about because I love uh, the director Bernardo Bertolucci. And I went to his funeral in Rome when he died. And I just stood there sobbing by his coffin it, uh, because he was so so talented and stealing beauty is not just a coming of age story it's also because it's made by an italian he also comments on some of the negative changes that that italy was going through and 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 he doesn't romanticize uh the expat experience he shows that yeah this this english couple they're living in tuscany but they they are nostalgic for elements of their life back in London. And, and I, I really appreciate how he manages to make such a, a beautiful, whimsical, romantic film, but then also uh, slips in reality and, uh, and, and, the, and the drawbacks of, of, of living in Italy and, and does it in a way that's not, uh, that's not depressing, but it's still there, you know, it's still there showing, showing uh, what, what it's like to live in this country. I love the Bourne series. I love thrillers. I love all the James Bond films. I love Casino Royale. I just think that's one of the best. The Before Sunrise, Before Sunset, Before Midnight trilogy, absolutely incredible because these 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 films were shot in real time, so with nine years between each film, and the actors uh, are literally older, and and you follow these two characters and. Pretty much the, the whole film is dialogue, just two characters walking around cities. And this trilogy is so interesting because the first one is your, your classic romantic, you know, meet, guy meets a girl on a train and they jump off and, and you know, decide to, to walk around Vienna all night long and get to know each other. And, and obviously that's very romantic. But what is super interesting is that it is so heavy on dialogue and it works. It's captivating and you only have two two characters essentially and you're you're just it's so intimate and it's so authentic and I, I believe that they sort of improvised a lot of the dialogue and you can really feel that it, it's just it feels so so natural and and then you know they waited sort of nine years I think between 
films and the actors had literally grown up and were at a different life stage and then they they filmed the meeting again these two characters and it's so fascinating because you see these 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 this trilogy you know you see these three different points in a relationship when you first meet uh when you meet again and you and you you're a little bit older and a little bit less naive and then afterwards after they've been together and had children and just seeing how you keep desire alive and i think that analysis set across this span of time is is just absolutely fascinating and and heartbreaking and 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 also inspiring because because ultimately these are two romantics who are flawed like all of us and are just struggling to deal with the passing of time and the the, the idea that that you know we can't be young forever Molly uh, wrote, I've been living in Italy for just under a year and I knew it would be hard, but I didn't realize how hard. Any advice for moments you thought about giving up? Oh, Molly, I wish I could give you a big hug. If you've lasted almost a year, you're doing so well. Nothing can prepare you for your first time living alone in a foreign speaking country. I read in your replies that you said you should try more to go out, but don't be so hard on yourself. Making social connections in Italy or any foreign speaking country to get a job or an apartment or make friends can be really tough. You might find Penelope Green's book, When in Rome, helpful because she talks about the struggle of just even being lonely quite a bit. I'm not sure what aspect you're finding the most difficult, but you mentioned uh, finding an apartment is hard. It's true that now things are more tricky because of Airbnb. Italians can charge so much to tourists who stay just one or two nights or they prefer to keep their apartment free for the high season, which now with this warmer weather extends to almost 10 months a year. So long-term renters have very little bargaining power. I remember when I was looking for an apartment in Barcelona back when I was 20, and I would have to work out all the buses and the subways to get to these addresses in neighborhoods I was completely unfamiliar with. It was so complicated and tiring. I didn't even know if it was worth it because I wasn't familiar with the city. And then I remember one guy had an ad for a roommate and it took me all day to work out how to get there. And when I finally showed up, it turned out he expected me to also look after his toddler throughout the day, which he forgot to mention in the ad. So uh, experiences like this can be quite uh, exhausting, let's say. Eventually, I decided to forget ads and do it the other way around. I found the street or neighborhood I wanted to live in and then went and hung out at the cafe or bar every day asking locals or the barista if they knew of anyone with a place to rent nearby and try to think laterally, think like, is there a little old senora who maybe has a spare room and you have to share her kitchen or maybe she needs you to go and do her shopping once a week, but that could be some sort of arrangement uh, that could entice her into renting out a, her guest room. Think about sort of lateral solutions like this. If you're struggling socially, just know it's not your fault. Italians have their groups of friends that they've known since birth and often their parents and grandparents have known each other for generations before. So although Italians are welcoming and friendly, most tourists don't realize that when you live here, it's hard to break into social circles more than superficially. Sure, you can have conversations and you can uh, go out for a coffee or something, but making those deeper relationships, it really does take time. Also, the reality of being an expat is that you will inevitably find friendships with fellow expats, but this is a transient world due to visas and greater difficulty finding work or the trend of spending six months or a year in Italy just to study. So if you find someone amazing, you'll have these belly laughs and you'll bond over all the, the, the shared struggles. And then they'll say, oh, I'm going off back home uh, to their home country in a month or so. And this this can be quite uh, disruptive because as soon as you find someone that you really connect with, uh, inevitably their time is up and, and, uh, and they're leaving. I'm not sure if you're studying or working, but I would advise trying to find a part-time job, anything, even if it's beneath your skill set, even if it's poorly paid, uh, even if it's babysitting for a couple going on holiday to another part of Italy for one week. I did this for a month and my Italian improved so much just being around these two little girls. I've uh, even done unpaid work just so that I can feel a part of the society 
Italians or any locals see you differently once you are a part of the ecosystem and not just some whimsical art student who they assume is here on their parents' money and just passing through to say that they've done the Dolce Vita. Once you have a job, it just opens up so many more opportunities to, to connect with people. Now, I'm sure you've tried all of this and I know it's not like all these invitations just fall from the sky when you go out into the piazza. But I found by working and talking to as many people as possible, which for me as an introvert wasn't always easy, uh, one connection can lead to a coffee, which leads to a dinner, which leads to someone suggesting you join them for a weekend trip. And slowly you can establish yourself. But yeah, it does take time. And also, if you do decide to go home, that's not you giving up. You got yourself here. You're trying with a language, you're experiencing a whole different culture, uh, you're testing yourself emotionally, and the lessons and independence that you've learned here will last you a lifetime. So just because your story doesn't end with you living here permanently doesn't mean it's not been a successful experience. Oh, 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 oh,